Knowles on the News. Susan Knowles. And welcome to this segment of Knowles on the News. I hope everything is going well for you out there. Seems like it's been such a long time. It, it's, every week I do this, and it just seems like typically the week goes by really fast. But this week has just gone by very slowly. And it seems like it's been forever since I did the Knowles on the News last week. Um, as always, a lot has happened. We've had a lot in the news about uh, Colin Kaepernick, as you know. And I did want to address him briefly. I didn't want to give him any more than his, uh, you know, additional 15 minutes of fame that he has obviously wanted to get. You know, I get so tired of people like him. I really do. People who who live in a different world than the rest of us. I don't have a $100 million mansion or all these cars or I don't have a contract with the NFL, you know, whatever the case may be with him. And, and I'm, I'm sure that most of you don't either. And yet this person comes on the scene and has to basically, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you what it's like to be oppressed. Uh, I, I'm going to stand up for the little guy and, and tell you what it's like. You know, I don't I don't mind him having a voice. And as everybody knows, you know, it's freedom of speech. He can stand up and sit down and do whatever he wants, say this, say that. I don't really care. You know, he has the right to do that, just like anybody else. And I would defend his right to do that. Here's here's what I don't defend, though. When When you put on the uniform, when you're sitting there as a 49er, you need to do what the rest of the team is doing. Okay, you're a team at that point. Quit calling attention to yourself. Do you not have enough attention? Don't, don't you get enough attention in your world of the ego? You know, I, I saw a picture of him with uh, this, gosh, this car, with beautiful car, you know, a little red sports car. I, I can only imagine what it costs. And he's standing there, and it's like, Oh yeah, this is this is the guy next door, you know. He he gets me. He understands me. He understands too what it's like to be an African American and be oppressed, you know, except for the reason that his birth mother is white and the people who adopted him, the parents that adopted him are white and and really that has nothing to do with anything except for the fact that Colin is coming out and saying, you know, all black people are oppressed. Well, I think you probably consider yourself in that category. And so are you saying you're oppressed? Because if you are, I want the kind of oppression that you have to drive around in and to live in, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I, I say that, but obviously I really wouldn't want to have that. I, I, I like to live comfortably, but I don't like to go to the extremes in anything. But what I what I really resent, again, is somebody like him who stands up, knows that he will draw attention to himself, and draws attention at the expense of his team, at the expense of how people may view his team and others because of his personal opinion. Why don't you have your personal opinion off the field? And then, I don't have a problem with that. You know, I, I think what we try to do these days is we don't understand the meaning of the word team anymore. Team means I'm going to go on the field and I'm going to do whatever I want to when I feel like it with my team. And, and you know, there, there are people now at high school. I, I can't remember where in the United States this high school is. I think it may be South Carolina where this young lady, she's African-American, she wants to wear a certain headdress, she's a cheerleader, and she wants to, she thinks it's racist because they're telling her, no, you know, I, we don't want you to wear that. I, and I don't know all the circumstances, but when you're on a team, you got to look like and dress like the rest of the team. You know, if you want to be a cheerleader individually and stand off to the side and do it at your own time, your own expense, uh, when you're sanctioned and allowed to do that at your school, go ahead and do it. Dress any way you want to. But when you're sitting there and you're and you're saying I'm part of a team, then be a part of the team. You know, I'm in high school. I was on the 
on on a team. I was on a square dance team. If anybody out there knows what that is and remembers that. And we all dressed alike. Same color, same color dress, same color pants uh, that the guys had. It, we we had the same. We, I don't think we were allowed to wear anything in our hair. <laughs> we had the same shoes. Every Everybody looked the same because it's called a team. And can you be an individual on a team? Sure you can. You know, for Colin, he can be a quarterback and he has a different position that anybody else on the team has. So he has a different function. Therefore, he's an individual in his in what he does, but he's still a member of that team. You can't go out and be a quarterback and start tossing the ball uh, to the other side, to the other team, so that they can make uh, a score, you know, score a touchdown against Colin's team, right? So... Why do I why do I think it's okay for Colin to sit on the sidelines and not stand when his team is standing? I don't think it's okay. Get off your butt, stand up. You don't have to say the words, you don't have to put your hand on your heart. I mean, follow the president's lead. Don't put your hand on your heart. Don't show any type of respect like that. I mean, but the least you can do is stand up. I think you're getting paid enough that you can just get off your keister for five seconds and, and act like you're enjoying yourself. You know, they're coming to San Diego on Thursday and they're going to be playing the Chargers. And I really, really hope, and I, I, I know it's too, too much to hope for, but I, I really wish the people in San Diego would show him such a warm welcome. You know, the same response that Roseanne Barr did when she came there and made a mockery of, of singing the national anthem and she was booed profusely. She claims, oh my gosh, I, 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 I didn't do that on purpose. I just, I'm a bad singer. Well, why are you singing in the national anthem then if you're that bad? But anyway, I, I really do hope that Colin gets the same welcome so that he knows it's not appreciated. And everybody goes, well, you know, but, but wait, Susan, he has a right to his freedom of speech. I, I get that. Not on the team's time. Not on my time as a fan. You want to do it? G- do something after the game. Have a press conference and, and talk your little heart out. But I get really sick of these egotistical people who think that they can say and do whatever they want to do and have no repercussions. You know, he may have the right to sit down, say something or whatever. I And I have a right to say, oh, I hope they boo him off the field. I hope that the, the 49ers drop him. You know, whatever the case may be. You know, I, I mean, there's certain responsibilities that go along with the position that you play. And part of that is being a team member when you're on the field or sitting on the sidelines before the game starts. You're there at the game. Be a team member. And I know in San Diego, I think it's military night or something like that. I don't know if that was already planned or if it's something that they they put together. And I know some of the military are out, or supposedly in the media, it's saying that the military, some of them support him and his right to say what he's saying. Well, you know, again, that's true. And uh, I hope you support my right not to buy a ticket to the game. I won't be there. I'm not going to support him. And I, I could care less what they do, whether they keep him on the team or not. You know, it, it's just like, again, these, these, uh, these celebrities, when they, they talk about, you know, how much they dislike something or dislike the country, they get political, whatever. You know, that's a risk you take. If you want to talk like that and risk your career, you have every right to do that. Now, it's a little different with celebrities, but because it's, it's not a team effort but you know would you would you expect an actor to start saying different lines during the show because he or she felt like putting their personal comments in of course you wouldn't you know they're getting paid to do a job and Colin Kaepernick is getting paid to do his job so go do your job you want to have your political views have them afterwards and you know the truth of the matter is with Colin you know, he has converted to Islam, according to what we know. And he's dating a, a girlfriend now who's a, is a, a Black Lives Matter activist. Okay, there, there's your issues right there. So suddenly, Colin, you know, he knows about the, the, the struggles of African Americans because he's, he's dating a BLMer. Well, 
you know, how long is that going to last, Colin? Probably a little bit longer than your career at the way you're going. So maybe you better reassess. And I mean, that would explain why Colin has this humongous beard now that he didn't have. Before, I think he was pretty clean shaven. So now he's, you know, he's into Islam and, uh, you know, he grows a beard. Fine. If your team allows you to have a beard, great. If they don't, shave it. You know, I, I just think that there are organizations, they need to continue to apply rules. You know, what if the military, what if some guy in the military, some woman in the military decides, huh, you know what, I don't want to stand when the national anthem is played. Well, I think there's going to be a problem. I don't know about you. And that person, you know, has a freedom of speech somewhat in the military, but they really, they don't. <laughs> and people don't understand that. And they sometimes they don't like that. Yet you have a freedom of speech or, or your your constitutional rights to a point. I get that, but you're still in the military. You have to obey orders, right? I mean, if you don't, if you're in the military, you don't obey orders, then it's total chaos. We haven't reached that point yet. I think we're we're probably going to get there with the type of people we're allowing in, and understanding, you know, that they're gang members now uh, that are that are being allowed into the military, and then these people that are have proven themselves in the military and long-term careers and officers. Well, you know, Obama's gotten rid of those people. You know, he's, he's busy now pardoning the, the people who are uh, the drug dealers that are in prison. We're, you know, pardoning, pardoning those people, but we got to get the military, the good people, we got to get them out. Anyway, I digress on that. So there's a reason why when you have a team sport, a team organization, a military, whatever the case may be, when you're supposed to act as a unit, there's a reason for that. People don't just, you know, put those things out there for the heck of it. But it, it seems like these days, it, which is really odd, you know, Let, let's just say this, it's, it's really odd in a time where people sort of Progressives want you to see yourself as the collective and they want to get rid of the individual. We seem to be having these people who are popping up you know, either on the uh, you know the football field or like the young lady in South Carolina, uh, somebody who is you know wanting to be express themselves as an individual regardless of what everybody else is doing. It's so odd that those people are cropping up during a time when progressives have mostly convinced our young people and, and many people that it's all about the collective and not about the individual. So, you know, I have to think about that a little bit. You know, the dichotomy there and what's really happening. And in some respects, what I see happening, though, are those people who want to be the rule breakers, who want to create the chaos, who don't like traditional values, who want to get rid of the way that America has always run itself and how it's been known. You know, we, we're a country who's based and founded on God, family, country, right? So let's destroy all that, right? I, I mean, in a way, that's the way I see it. I, I see that these individuals who are kind of standing up, they're not standing up for a cause, really. And, and, and I guess you could say, well, Kaepernick is, you know, he, he's standing up for oppressed black people. Well, no, I think Kaepernick is, is standing up for a lie that he's been told and that, that he believes, Maybe because he's getting what he wants from his BLM or girlfriend. I, you know, I don't know what the case may be. Um, he's obviously benefiting in some way from it. And now he's getting sort of caught up in it all. You know, but again, it's not really a noble cause that these individuals are standing up for. It's, it's standing up sort of, again, buying into this lie, this activist lie. And... I don't know. If you haven't read my article on The Blaze, it's do black lives really matter? Do black lives matter? I, I don't think so. And I won't go into what the article is. You can go there and, and read it if you want. But the point of my article is if if black lives are really, if they really matter, you know, to this organization that has in its title Black Lives Matter, if, if black lives really matter, where's the proof in the pudding? What are you doing to show that there is some benefit? I, I think I hear you talking, but I don't see you walking the walk. And I, I, it's the same thing with Colin Kaepernick. 
if you really want to make a difference, if you're so worried about oppressed black people and you think they're really oppressed, then why don't you do something beneficial rather than stand up in a defiant manner on the field and, and show your intelligence by doing so? Why don't you go out? Why don't you, why don't you set up a fund? Take some of that money. When, you know, Don't buy your red sports cars. Take some of that money or, or do a fundraiser. You could get a handful of people at least there that will come and, and, and give you money, donate money to your cause. Come there and, you know, get people to give you money for, let's say, buying shoes for poor, oppressed black children. If you just want to, if you just want to stay with the, uh, the black race and not help all races, uh, at least do that. Set up a scholarship fund. Set up a, you know, a fund where they can become athletes like you. You know, actually help people. Do something that people can look at it and measure it and go, oh, wow. This, now, this is really good. This guy does what he says he's going to do. You know, there have been plenty of athletes that can show you the way, if you're not too egotistical, and you can sit and listen to them for five seconds, that can show you how it's done. That you can go out in public and go to schools. Maybe you should visit schools. And, and help with their athletic program. Whatever. Whatever the case may be. What, where, wherever your passion lies. But don't give me this Black Lives Matter, you know, now they're so important because you're dating a Black Lives Matter girlfriend and you've converted to Islam. You know, pff, really. Seriously. And, and what's going to happen, you know, when you when you don't have a contract anymore with an NFL team or you're, you know, you get injured and you no longer can play. Are black lives going to matter then? Are you really going to care about the oppressed black people? I mean, or at that point, you become one yourself, right? You and your charmed life living in your mansions and with the people that, that thank God, you know, took you in and adopted you and treated you as their own child, which you are. You know, it was really sad, too. I saw this uh, couple of comments that uh, it was an African-American male made to uh, the birth mother of Colin Kaepernick and was really chastising her for adopting out her son, giving him up for adoption. And it was just like, I guess, really horrible stuff that he was saying uh, because later on he admitted to saying those things and he apologized to her, which I thought, man, this was, this did me so good you know like it did my heart good to see this to actually see somebody say you know what I made a mistake I should not have talked to you in that manner you know you there's nothing wrong with what you did in adopting out your child if you felt that it was in your child's best interest you did the absolute right thing and he said to her you didn't deserve what I said to you I was rude and I apologize wow I I can't even tell you the last time that I saw somebody say something like that and, and I wish people talked to each other like that more and more. Because this is, this is the world that we need to live in. This is the world that we need to boost up. The part of the world that, the good side. Uh, we're, we're so free these days to tell people, you know, to go whatever themselves and, and, and do whatever. We're, we're so fast at doing that sometimes. And it's like, I think sometimes we forget that there are human beings. I, I know, for example, uh, somebody, you know, if they disagree with my article, sometimes they can say the nastiest things, the nastiest personal attacks. And it's like, one, you don't even know me. We've never even met. How can you say those things? And, and again, they forget that there's a human being connected to that article, connected to, you know, that, that tweet, whatever the case may be. You know, and that kind of, that happened to me on Facebook. And I could have walked away and, and lowered my head and been depressed about what somebody said. But instead, I went back to that person and we had a conversation. And, and now that person follows me on Facebook and is a human being. Because you know why? He was a human being in the beginning. He got carried away and saying things. Because, again, it was like there's no human on the other side. So I can say whatever I want. But then he came to a point where he realized, God, there is a human being out there. And what I said wasn't wasn't nice and I apologize I I would love to see us get more to that point because we're we're not there 
but we can't we can't make up things you know like Colin does believing in the lie of the people like the Black Lives Matter who who are funded by George Soros with 33 million dollars who are funded by liberal left-wing groups who have gotten pledges for the next six years at the tune of a hundred million dollars I'm sorry to me that doesn't sound oppressive to an organization with uh, African Americans at, at who lead that organization and again, I, I looked at that organization to say, what are you going to do for the African Americans that you claim to care about? And I'll tell you what they're going to do. Nothing. They're going to line their pockets because that's what those activists do. That's what those elitists do. No matter what race you are from, that's what happens. It's all about you getting what you need and and you take the most vulnerable people and you, you give them false hope. And then you leave them worse off than when you found them. It's kind of like what the Democrats have done to the African-American race. And the African-Americans uh, you know, believe their lie and continue to believe it. And I, I challenge anyone out there, black, white, Asian, Hispanic, go read the real history on African-Americans. And learn the truth for once and not just the lies. And then, and then people and activist organizations like the Black Lives Matter, they can't do what they do because you're going to know that you're being lied to. You're going to know that chaos is being created so that they can stay in control and continue to line their pockets. That's what you're going to learn. And if you're afraid to go and learn that, well, then I guess that you can continue to live the lie. But for those who don't choose to do that, go learn the real history. You know, and I, I think, again, as, as human beings, we all need to stop this hating on each other for whatever reason. Buying into the lie, again, they want nothing more than for us to be divided. And we've got to learn this quickly, people, because we are going down fast, you know, we have this election coming up. We, uh, don't even get me started there. But we, we, have, we have a candidate, uh, you know, a nominee. We have Hillary, who is basically, anybody looking at her, you don't have to be a doctor. There's something going on. I don't know what it is. It doesn't look good. It really doesn't. And yet, we don't question that. We don't demand that her medical records be released. We don't demand that the all of the emails be released before the election. We don't demand that she come out in public and answer questions. We don't demand anything of her. And again, if we could just stand together and, and demand these things, we would get them. But we're a country that just kind of sits back, waits for something to happen, or we've just given up because we don't know what to do. I mean, we've got the media is in bed with her and they do they don't report on anything that's going on. People who do report get fired like the contributor at Huffington Post claims that he was fired when he challenged Hillary's health. And others who they, they say Drew Pinsky, Dr. Drew Pinsky, I, I don't know about that. I don't know if he was his uh, his show was canceled because he questions Hillary's health. He's still on CNN. So I don't know what the case may be there. But we're going to have to start doing more. And again, it's so hard. And, and, and you have so many things coming at you at one time. You don't know what to do. It's like, it's like uh, you know, what you used to see in the circus. And I don't think they do this anymore. But they used to have these, uh, these, um, these sticks, let's say. And it was, there was a plate on top of each stick. And you start shaking, you know, turning the stick. And it, it turns the plate. And the plate stays up and then you go to the next one and you do the, put the plate on top of the stick and you start turning that one. And so you've got two plates going now and then you have to keep adding plates and, and keep going back each time and, and turning the, the stick again so that the, the plate keeps turning so that it doesn't fall. That's kind of, I don't know, in a lot of respects, I think that's how a lot of people think that their lives feel to them right now. You're trying to balance work. You're trying to balance, uh, you know, educating your children. You're trying to keep your children safe. You're trying to figure out how you're going to survive for the next couple of years and in the economy and uh, you know, on and on and on. I mean, it's like one decision after another and it comes at you like bullets. 
it's not like, oh, well, something happened today and then, you know, next week or two weeks and there's some big thing happening. It's like, bam, 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 every day and sometimes more than once a day. And that's kind of what what we're kind of dealing with. And, you know, it's too much for some people. And so they just kind of check out and go, oh, well, I, you know, whatever happens, happens. And I, I think that a number of people, you know, they're really concerned about this country. And I think we have a lot of people who are still, you know, into this, never Trump, never Cruz, crooked, this, crooked, that. We, we need to stop tearing each other apart we need to allow each other to do what we feel that we need to do. And I, I, I know everybody wants to find a reason if Donald Trump loses to blame somebody else. You know, you, you can't do that. I mean, you can. <laughs> but, you know, when your country is going to fall apart one way or the other, uh, let's say, or if it does, in either, if either candidate gets elected, Let's just say it does for the moment. You're going to need to stand together to work together to build this country back up. And let's say Trump gets elected and everything's hunky dory. <laughs> you know, okay, hunky dory. I know nobody uses that word anymore, but it, it just sounded so appropriate for now. But, but let's say everything is fine. You're still going to need people, you, you're going to need to work together and bring people around. And you don't get that by by talking down to them by be, being so negative by attacking each other and i've i've seen it and heard it on both sides this is still our country and i think what happens is people again they love to argue and they attack each other and that way they don't have to look at the main problems you know the, we have some real problems here we have Congress who doesn't do its job. On the local level, people don't do its job. They, they don't do their jobs. We, we have the EPA now who is trying to get into our bedroom and figure out how many, you know, how many gay people there are. What, what do gay people have to do with the environment? I don't get that. But you have all these, these uh, government agencies that weren't elected who are trying to run our lives. We have our, our administration, our Congress, whomever, taking lands that they want to claim as their own, an eminent domain, and just taking them. I mean, and, and there's more. And you know it as well as I do. And you know all of the examples that I could cite. So as long as we stand there and fight each other, as long as we, we stand there and believe the lies like the Black Lives Matter, and other activists who just want to create the the chaos. As long as we stand there and believe all of that, we're going to continue to have our rights, our freedoms taken from us. And it's kind of like, you know, it's like a, a dog, two dogs like fighting over a bone, right? They're standing there and they're just fight, 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 fight. And, and, and you know, the, the camera pans back and you see, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, a tiger coming to attack them. It's kind of sometimes I think how some Americans feel. You know, we're sitting there, we're fighting over these little issues. And I don't mean that the election is a little issue. But whether or not a person votes your way or not, it's really none of your business or anybody else's business. Yes, I know that you would like for them to vote for your candidate. I get that. We have that in every election. But we've never really been fighting like this before. So you're going to sit there and fight over the bone while something else comes and devours you. <laughs> and most of that I'm, is our, like our big government that's just overtaking everything that we do. The banking industry, the car industry, the healthcare industry, you name it. And yet we're fighting over the little bone here. And that's exactly what they want you to do. Because as long as you're doing that, they can just keep swooping in and taking more and more and more. So keep fighting over that bone, and hopefully when you get that bone, it's going to be worth it to you. And for the most part, I don't think it is. But, you know, if, if that's what helps you sleep at night, I guess that's what you'll continue to do. I want to, on the other hand, I want to work with people who, we, we can't be like-minded in everything, but there are 
there are a few issues that we can be like-minded on. I don't think there are really too many people who, who really love the idea and, and welcome the idea of having their lives as being taken over by the government and having every aspect of it run by the government. You know, I, I wrote a book like three years ago called Freedom's Fight, A Call to Remember. And when I wrote the book, I, I felt very strongly that we were headed this way. But it was a fiction. You know, and I kept saying to myself, but it's a fiction. You know, you know that, right? It's just a fiction. But I, I'm telling you, our lives are kind of, they're headed that way. And the things I wrote in that book, I could honestly see them coming true. I did kind of three years ago have a feeling that it might happen. And, and more and more today, each and every day, I think, my gosh, you know, th- these things could really happen. And that's scary. Very scary. We're, we're headed in the wrong direction. We need every person on board, okay? Everybody working together that we can get working together. And, and whether that person is going to vote for Trump like you want them to, or if they're going to vote for Hillary like nobody wants them to, Whatever the case may be, there are bigger fish to fry. There's, there's trying to keep our country going, trying to, to stave off, you know, what is coming in, in, in this country. The terrorism attacks. I mean, we have John, John Kerry, you know, Mr. Brains there, who's, who's saying, wow, I, I think the media should just stop talking about terrorism. Yo, yeah, John, because that way it'll just go away. It, you know, if you don't talk about something, it just goes away. If there's a hurricane headed towards you and you just don't talk about it, well, it, it's, it's okay. It's just going to go away, right? We know that if you just live in denial or avoidance, it'll all be okay. Yeah, right. And also, you can do anything you want when people aren't talking about it. This administration is great for the fact that they that they just do things, right? Nobody talks about it. Nobody brings it up. The media barely, you know, talks about it anymore. And they can do whatever they want. I mean, how many of you knew that, that the, Obama the other day pardoned another, what, 110 people, 111 uh, drug people, drug dealers, whatever the case may be that they're in prison for. So they're out on the street again. Wow, whew, that's great. So they can go and they can buy and sell and ruin more lives, get right back out there on the street. You know, because doing drugs isn't a bad thing, right? It's a victimless crime. No, it's not. And you know that. You know that. Our country is being destroyed from the inside out. From the people that we were told were there to protect us. The people that we were told had our best interests at heart. When is everybody going to wake up? And I know I'm not talking to you that are listening right now. I, I know you know this and you know you've been out there sounding the alarm. But when is, when is the rest of the country going to wake up and realize that they've been fooled? I, I don't know if that's going to happen. I honestly don't know. But for those of us who are awake and those of us who know there's a problem, fighting in, in fighting with each other is not the way to resolve things. It really isn't. The more divided that you are, the less we are going to accomplish together. I, I, I really wish I could go on social media. I, Facebook, uh, for one, just seems to be worse. And I wish there wasn't a conversation that day on, oh, how we're going to blame those people, how we're going to blame those people who voted for Cruz if, 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 uh, if Donald Trump loses. Come on. Don't be ridiculous. Don't, don't be a Sean Hannity. Don't sit there and blame everybody else for what you wanted to happen but maybe didn't happen. Donald Trump hasn't lost and people are talking like he already, like Sean Hannity, is already talking, let me just find out who I can blame now because Trump has lost. You know, you never get anywhere by sitting there. If somebody asks you, what are you good about? Or why should you have this job? You don't sit there and tell them all the reasons why you can't get that job because you're blaming it on somebody else. Or how, well, you would have been good at the job, but somebody else uh, tried to get in your way and wouldn't let you do what they were do- you, you wanted to do. Or you're blaming the guy who also applied for the job. Come on. Stand on your own two feet. Take responsibility for what you're doing. I don't care if you're Hillary, Donald Trump, or Mickey Mouse. You know, if you do it and you're not successful, then you have to look and see what it was that you could have done better. For Donald Trump, there's been a change in management every other week. 
There's been a change in policy every other week. Get it together. Stay on one thing. Focus on what it is that you need to do and go out there and try to win the thing. But don't sit there and try to blame everybody else in the event that you don't win. And, you know, so far, it's everybody else around Donald Trump who's talking like that. Donald Trump isn't sitting there now blaming people. He's just going on and and moving forward because he knows that's what he has to do. He has to stop focusing on the negative and what can't happen and focus on the positive of what he feels that he can do. That's how you win. You don't, you don't sit there and attack each other and say, oh, it's your fault. Well, if he doesn't win, I'm going to blame you. No, come on, Sean. You know better than that. I mean, that, the, the, the rant yesterday that Sean Hannity had was absolutely ridiculous. It sounded like a little schoolboy who didn't get to do what he wanted to do. And as I said, we haven't even had the election. I think Sean, Sean, I'm talking to you. You would, you would be better off if you focused your attention on what Trump needs to do and on what he has done, what you feel is important, what you feel is the winning strategy, not on, well, I'm going to blame everybody, I'm going to take my bat and stomp my feet and go home if my candidate doesn't win. Come on. I even got into yet yesterday. I I I I tweeted out a little meme. <laughs> it was my dog with this look on her face where that was just absolutely priceless. Like, oh my god, did I really hear that? And I put on there yeah, the words I put on the the picture were, um, "It's the moment that you realize that Sean Hannity has lost it." <laughs> and I and I tweeted it to Sean Hannity because I wanted him to see it. You know, I mean, it, it sounded like he'd absolutely lost it and lost. A lot of credibility. Again, we have to pull together as a nation. Sean, pull everybody together as a nation. Uh, You know, go over to to Trump because you know him. He's your friend, right? Tell him, you know what? I think you were wrong when you said we don't need the conservatives. We can do this on our own. You need to go over and say, you know, Trump, you need to bring everybody together. As many people as you can, you need to bring them together because you need the votes. You know, he's out there right now in the African-American community and and trying to talk to them and convince them. And, of course, when he starts talking to them, you know, then the media has to say, oh, well, look what he said. He's can can the audacity. I mean, of course, they're going to do that. Okay, so just expect it and move on. But I think in a lot of respects, you know, do I wish that African-Americans would vote some other way than Democrat? Absolutely. Again, they're being fooled. And they have been for so long, and and they just continue to vote for somebody because either A, they're Democrat, or B, they're they're African American without looking at qualifications. So I don't know if 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 his time spent in the African American community is really benefiting him. I hope it does, you know, but I don't know that it really will because forever they have voted Democrat. It's like some people in the South they vote Democrat no matter what. They don't look at the candidate and see if they're uh, qualified or not. All they do is they just vote for who their parents voted for, their grandparents voted for, and on and on and on. And then he's down, in, you know, going to Mexico City, and already the the president of Mexico has apologized, you know, for him coming over. Uh, but you know, so I mean, I, I know why he's going. He's hoping that's going to help with the Hispanic vote. I I don't know. I mean. A lot of Hispanics are already on board. Uh, They would have you believe in the media that they're not. We we can't believe the media anymore. If you believe the media without checking things yourself, then you're doing yourself a big disservice. Because they're going to make things look the way they want to make them look because they want Hillary in there. Because the people who hire them say, go out and do your job, get Hillary elected, don't say anything bad about her, and you can keep your job. I don't know. I don't want to live in that type of world. I don't want to have that type of position where I'm told what I have to do in order to survive, you know, which which means that I'm not allowed to to give the truth. Now, again, if I'm on a team, I'm going back to, to Colin, if I'm on a team and I signed up for that, then I already have knowledge of what I need to do. But I'm talking about as an individual. I don't want to go to some organization that tells me, okay, I only want you to write on this and, and you, can't, uh, you can only say this. You know, I have people who say to me, well, you, you write as a contributor to the blaze. You know, here it is, Glenn Beck telling you what to do. Uh, first of all, Glenn Beck, I don't even know if he reads my stuff. Uh, maybe he does. Maybe he doesn't. 
but he never tells me what I can or can't write. I've never had, you know, I, the process is it goes to an editor just like it does in every other, you know, website you want to write for if, anybody. It goes to an editor. They have to approve or, or you know, say reject it. I, I don't. I don't have the editor telling me, I'm sorry, uh, Glenn would be offended by this, and, and therefore you can't write about it. Sorry. No, that doesn't happen. You know, so, I mean, if, if, when the Blaze, if they start telling me that I can only write on certain subjects and I can't write on, on the things that Glenn disagrees with, then I'm not going to write for the Blaze. I'm not going to write for anybody that would do that. I, I, I'll, I'll do whatever else I have to do, but I'm not going to do that. And I, I, you know, I can't imagine these people in the media. If if that if money is worth your soul, then I guess that's what you're going to do. But at some point, you know, you're going to have to look back on what you've done, and and see if you're happy with that. See if you know on your deathbed, you, you're okay with the lies that you told, or you were okay with going along with getting along because, you know, you needed that sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars a year, whatever you're getting. I just don't want to be like that because I think, you know, where we're headed and the way people are treating each other, we're going to, it's going to be at a time where, you know, people are going to be forced to kind of, you know, choose sides and where they want to be. And I think a lot of times for the people who are going to be telling the truth, it's not going to be the best place and the best position to be in. But as I've said to you before, and I know that many of you feel the same way, I don't answer to man ultimately. You know, I don't. I answer to God. And that's that's where my concern lies, that I do the right thing because I know ultimately who I answer to. And I, I think so many people, I, I see them today and, and they seem to have forgotten that. And maybe, you know, I don't know, we're moving away from God. I mean, how how many how many years have we moved away from God and how how long will it take us to understand that we're not as a blessed country. We're not as blessed as we used to be. And why is that? Well, you, you know, talk to Bi- Bible scholars. Talk to the person on the street. And they'll all say the same thing. It's because we've turned our backs on God. And I, they're tr- it's the truth. And, you know, we're not, we're not getting that back. We're not going to get that blessing back by attacking each other and spending our, times doing, our time doing things like that. We're just not, it's not going to happen. I think we have to look and see what's important and really think about that rather than getting caught up in attacking each other maybe because we feel that we can't attack the system anymore or the system's too big that attacking it won't do any good. Whatever the case may be, we need to reevaluate what it is that we're doing and how we are doing it. You know, I think sometimes we, again, we really need to focus on some of the real issues, some of the things that are happening in our community that that perhaps we have allowed because we we haven't focused uh, we've allowed to get out of control i mean there, i read something that i just thought was incredible and i know there's an issue and there's always is an issue with drugs but i mean there were 24 heroin overdoses reported in one day in louisville kentucky i mean that's insane absolutely insane and they're talking about there are spikes and overdose spikes in communities in the neighboring states of Indiana, Ohio, and West Virginia. Why is that? What, what is causing that? I think a lot of it, I mean, look at how our culture has totally changed. Look at what we, we are valuing. For example, we, we sit there and we pretend, well, the administration does, that everything is just fine with the uh, with the with the jobs out there, everybody has a job. Everybody's happy. Everybody's making money. Things are so great. It's never been better. And we all know that isn't true. And we also know that the Obamacare medical costs are going you know going to skyrocket. I don't know about you, but the amount that we have to pay for medical coverage now is it's tripled practically since Obamacare. I mean, and it's only going to get worse. And people are eventually, they're not going to be able to afford that. And they're going to have to all go over to Obamacare unless whoever gets in gets rid of that. And we all know Hillary won't. She'll expand on it, bring back Hillary care that didn't work, probably add that to Obamacare so she can take the rest of the country down. But I, I think we have, we've crippled a lot of people in this society. You know, we, we've given them welfare benefits. 
so that they don't have to go work and they don't even have to think about getting a job. We have, we, we have just made up statistics that don't reflect the job market. And I think people have just said, you know, I, 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 I'm just going to go and, you know, I'll, I'll do drugs, whatever. I, I, it's like we've, we've taken away from people what they need in order to be functioning human beings and to feel good about themselves and to have a life that, that they want to have. And, and that requires a lot of time that people have to work. But when there are no jobs out there and you, you knock on doors and you can't find a job or you've, you know, you've, you've gotten an education and you can't get a job even if you're well-educated, I think a lot of people turn to drugs because they don't know what else to do. It's like nothing else matters anymore. And I think we have to, you know, whoever gets in, I mean, God, oh, I say that, but I mean, I, I hope Hillary doesn't get in, but, but whoever gets in, it, we, we can't just toss money at, at a problem. And, and that's what we're doing. We toss money. Oh, here, let's, let's, uh, let's help with mental health care and we'll get the, We'll we'll get uh, people help. That's all well and good, but that's a band aid. That's a band aid for the problem. You know, when you have these deeply rooted problems like this, you need to look and find out what the root cause is. And we don't do that anymore. We just apply band aids, just like we do. Let's say with Chicago, when we we, we every weekend, we know that tremendous amount of people are going to be killed and what do we do well we don't do anything the administration doesn't even want you to talk about it uh african americans uh like black lives matter oh no it you're being politically incorrect if you're not african american and you dare to talk about the realities of what's going on in chicago the black on black crime it, it just is what it is but we're not allowed to talk about it. We put a Band-Aid on it. And the Band-Aid is, oh, come on now. There are more cops, white cops, killing black, killing black people. But, we, you know, statistics don't prove that to be true. But that's what we say. Because we don't, I, I think in a lot of respects, people just don't know what to do about it. They don't know how to confront the problem. So they just pretend that the problem doesn't exist. But it's a huge problem. There's so many teenagers out there, you know, who are dying each weekend in Chicago. And, and, and why is that? Okay, let, let's talk about that issue. Why do we have that happening? Well, one, I would say some of it is bullets, stray bullets that fly and kill people who are standing around minding their own business or in their homes, you know, and it kills a child who's sleeping on a couch. You know, that is... That is because they just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. But what's causing those people to go out and, and, and fire those guns in the first place, and by the way, it's not the gun's fault, just for anybody who might tune in who is a progressive liberal. There's an issue that young people would feel that they don't have anything other that, to do other than to kill people or to, to go shoot up the streets or whatever. We have homes that are broken. We have homes that are typically maybe you know, run by a female who doesn't have a partner to help her raise children. And, and you, know, you may say, well, stop having children. Whatever. You have to work with things the way that you, you, know, the way you find them. So, you know, here again, here's another, here's another place that Black Lives Matter organization could help out. They could go alongside of these these households with a single parent and and help out be a, be a big brother be a, in a mentoring program to help these kids stay off the streets you know kids don't learn how to go shoot up people on their own they they learn that because you know they they see their own relatives doing that i you know it was amazing to me in some of my uh therapy sessions when i've had uh, let's say at risk teens that I've been working with. And what I do is I do something called a genogram, which is basically looking at your history and your family. And as you do that, it's like, it's like uh, diagramming out a family tree. And when you do that, you can find out some of the, the trouble areas in your family that maybe you didn't realize that, 
that you need to kind of look at and, and assess for your own life. And for example, by that, there are, sometimes there are families who you look and you see that your father, his father, your uncle, were all gang members, you know. And, and what that means is there's a system that says that this is a good thing, that that the let's say the males in the family have been gang members and so you if you're a male this is what you should do as well and the same happens for females as well or or if your family if there's uh, people in there who have been uh have trouble issues you know with alcoholism then you need to look out for yourself and make sure that you don't fall into the same traps and and maybe uh have issues with alcoholism as well or people in your family have done drugs same thing and, you know, also you may have family members that are in and out of prison all the time. And if it's a common thread that seems to run through the family, you need to go, whoa, wait a minute. Do I want to keep this cycle going or do I break this cycle? And then you have to figure out what's best for you. I think in a lot of these families, we don't break the cycle. We keep that cycle going. Now, whose fault is that? I mean, we could sit there and blame the family. We can sit there and blame how the kids have been taught, whatever. But it's not changing the problem. And we can't keep throwing money in places and, and, and just allowing the circumstances to be the same. It's like if you were having uh, drug issues, you know, you become a drug addict. You can't be put back in that same environment you were in, like maybe where you shot up with other druggies. You know, you're not, you can't go back in that same environment and expect things to be different. And let's say for those kids in Chicago, they're in the same environment all the time and the environment is not changed. So even if you help them, if they don't leave that environment, chances are they're going to continue the practices of whatever it was they were doing if they stay in that environment. And you, you have to help people. You know, I used to, to uh, know this young man who was killed in his environment. And he knew that he was going to, likelihood of him getting killed was very high unless he got out of that environment. And, you know, he was right. That's where he was killed. And he was only 17. And we, we need these groups who sit there and say, oh, you know, we really care about you. Go in there to Chicago over the weekend, Black Lives Matter, and instead of encouraging those people to protest or, you know, and I'm I'm alleging that you may be helping them in deciding whether or not to burn a building or loot it. I'm not saying that you're doing it, but I think maybe there's some encouragement along the way or or some encouragement that gets out of hand, let's say that. I'll, I'll, I'll allege that. that. That causes them to go down the wrong path. Why don't you help them show them a better way? Now, I don't think that you're going to do that because, again, if you do that and everything turns out well, you're not going to have a job and you're not going to, you're not going to, any, going to get any more donations because you're not going to have caused, cre- you know, created chaos, which is the sole purpose here. That's why you have the money. George Soros is the master of chaos. He wants you to create chaos. But I think, you know, we, we need to stop t- saying, oh, well, we can't talk about this because, well, you're not black, so you're not allowed to talk about that. And, and I think this administration, again, you know, for, for you out there who are African-American and, and you love Obama and what he's done for you, which he hasn't done anything for you, but he's actually taken money away from you and has, has made your neighborhoods worse, worse off. Now, why would he do that? You, you, you need, you know, I'm not. Uh, you need to ask yourself these things. But we just, we have to get over in this country this political correctness because, you know, once again, we're not allowed to deal with the real problems because we're not allowed to even have that discussion. It's it's taboo. And we have people, Black Lives Matter and other people who follow the group, you know, who are, who are wanting to yell and get in people's faces and tell them they have no right to talk about those things. And then at the same time, they turn around and, and scream white privilege. No, 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 no. And, and, and we have, the, you know, this, this group who likes to call themselves White Lives Matter after the Black Lives Matter doing it. 
And, and now they're going to be deemed a hate group because they call themselves White Lives Matter. It's okay for Black Lives Matter. There's no hate there. Oh, no. You know, you're just singling out a particular group, but there's no hate there. But you White Lives Matter people, you're not going to be allowed to do that because you are a hate group. Just like they've called the Tea Party a hate group, uh, most, you know, staunch conservatives, they, they look at the same way. It's a double standard. And the double standard is very dangerous. It's very dangerous to our communities. It's, it's very dangerous to our way of life. And we have to stop fighting each other so that we don't look at the real problems. We need, we need to fight the enemy. And as I, when I say enemy, I don't mean people. But we need to fight the evil that goes on in our world that causes these problems. And then these, these same evils convince others that, oh, there's no problem here. Really, there's no problem. There's no problem in Chicago with, you know, a, a, you, you can't talk about people who kill each other on the weekend like that. I, I mean, you got to let's look at something else. Let's look at those those haters, the white lives matter people. We, we've got to stop being distracted. Got to start focusing on where we need to focus. Now, how could we help Chicago? I, I don't know. Uh, probably by continuing to speak out about it. Probably by not allowing your voices to be silenced. Uh, not being afraid of political correctness. Uh, you know, again, I, I think people, they're afraid because they have so much to lose. They're afraid of losing their jobs. And I get that. You know, you have kids to feed. And I get that. Maybe you should just hope your kids don't go and move to Chicago. I, I don't know. But I know that things are, in a lot of respects, they're, they're getting worse. And if we continue to just put our heads in the sand and do nothing about it, or we don't at least speak up about it or write about it, whatever the case may be, then, then people are going to, you know, those people that really don't listen to the news all that much, they're just going to assume that everything is okay. That there, that everything's fine. Uh, I can go back worrying about, you know, what color blouse I'm going to wear to work next week. I mean, I think our problems are are bigger than that, and we really do need to keep that in mind. And it's it's working for the future of America. You know, that really needs to concern us. It's it's the future of your children and your grandchildren. That's important here. They're going to have the brunt of all of this if we if we don't do something about it and and at least get the ball rolling then they're going to have to be the ones that that clean everything up and honestly i'm not sure that they know how to do that because they've been told you don't question things that everything is fine they've been told that the government has it we'll take care of it don't you worry about it well, we've all seen that that doesn't work, but they, I, I, they haven't seen that because they're being brainwashed with that. And after so long, you know, you're being brainwashed, you, you stop being able to critically think about things. You just think, okay, well, all right, I'll take your word for it because you said it's fine. You're going to take care of me. And, and I see that welfare is, uh, you know, pretty high up there now. Everybody's what, how the big percentage of people that are on welfare now. So I guess that's true. You're going to just take care of me. I don't need to worry about it. I can just go back reading my EPA manuals in school, doing Common Core, and everything's going to be fine. No, everything isn't fine. And I think more and more of us realize that every day. But we can't just keep focused on a presidential election and feel that electing the, the, the person that you want in as president is going to take care of all of these problems. We have to be the ones that are actively going out there and trying to bring attention, at least bring attention to the issues and not allow people to just put Band-Aids on them and walk away and say, oh, all done. Everything's fine. We have to be the voice. We have to be the ones who say, enough is enough. We need to do something about this. Let's stop kidding ourselves. And let's actually start working together to help our country make it a better place. We're not as divided as this administration would like us to believe. 
there are wonderful Hispanics, Asian, whites, African Americans out there who work together every day, who care about each other and show it each and every day. Let's focus on those people. Let's work together with those people because those people are the ones that are going to help this country get back to a better place than this country was before. It may take quite a long time, but without the light in this country, we don't have a fighting chance. With the people who are the light, we have a fighting chance in this country to do the right thing and get back on the right track. Thank you very much for joining me today. It's been a pleasure, as always, to be able to talk to you. I thank you so much. I'll see you again next week. Have a great Labor Day. I'll talk to you soon. Take care.